Um, yeah, n neither do I. Uh, like, I think it's something like symplectic structure in JT gravity. C c could that, would it fit? Okay, okay, perfect. So thank you very much for an opportunity uh, to speak here and I should probably apologize. Some of you have already heard more or less the same talk in, in, in Paris, uh, I think almost exactly one month ago. So uh, let me start with uh, motivation and results and I should mention that this work is joined with Eckhart Meinrenken. Um, so it's uh, motivated by, uh, by a physics story. Let me recall the definition of the so-called JT or Jakif Teitelboim gravity. So the setup is as follows. We have sigma an oriented to surface. And actually, like in this very short introductory part, I will not be very precise about certain things and then, but very soon I will be more precise about them. So typically this would be surface with boundary for our considerations. So uh, JT um, is a Lagrangian uh, theory where G uh, is a Riemannian metric on sigma and uh, there is a scalar field, let's call it X. So JT is defined by the following action, it's an integral over sigma, the scalar or sometimes it's called a dilaton field and here the uh, uh, Gauss curvature of G plus one times the volume element defined by the metric. Uh, so uh, in this room there are people who are much better specialists in JT, in particular Thomas Strobel who like many years ago uh, solved the Lorentzian version of it in great detail. Um, but uh, what, what's going to be uh, uh, important for us is that the Euler-Lagrange equations, uh, in particular the Euler-Lagrange equation for the field X tells you that Kg is equal to minus one and this means that G is a hyperbolic metric on the surface. So that, that, that would be of crucial importance. So actually, uh, JT gravity was popular some decades ago and then recently, or recently by mathematical, in mathematical scale, very long ago on physics scale, for like about five years ago. So like it's a very, very long physics time, very short mathematical time. Um, so uh, there, there was a renewed interest in this uh, uh, theory and in particular they're inspired by the work of Saad, Schenker and Stanford. Um, who uh, deduced from analyzing um, uh, this um, JT gravity the following things. Uh, first of all, uh, moduli of hyperbolic matrix with ideal or let's say infinity boundary. So the surface would have a boundary and that boundary will be some way at infinity um, is symplectic. Uh, so I'll continue here. So there is a very thorough action of uh, diffeomorphisms of the boundary and let me, to simplify discussion for today, let me assume that the boundary is always a circle and then uh, there is a relation to 
to topological recursion for Mirzakhani volumes. So the, the aim of our work and the aim of the talk is to understand a little bit what we can say on the mathematical side about those statements. Uh, uh, and so I'll try to make, at least in our language, more precise some of the statements and tell you a little bit about the proofs or how, how it works. I should maybe say that I will comment on some of those items, but not, not on all of them. So I'll discuss this part, I'll discuss this part, this part, but I, I have nothing to say at the moment about the topological recursion part. So, uh, so that's basically what I want to talk about. And uh, maybe now I try to, to set up some of the definitions more precisely and tell you what, what is our, what are our result, list our results, and then we're gonna discuss how, uh, what, how, how we, we're trying to prove them. Ezra. Oh, it's, it's infinite. This will, be, this, will be, this will be clear immediately when I set up the problem. Yes, it's, a, it's, it's an infinite, yeah, right. It's an infinite dimensional story. And actually, uh, in, uh, in the SSS paper, it is set up as an infinite uh, dimensional story. Maybe I should also mention one more word. Um, so, so they are saying, that there is um, some kind of holographic duality, whatever it means, uh, between certain moduli of hyperbolic metrics and certain Virasoro quadrant orbits. So these are geometric objects which were studied over several decades. And this is, uh, this is, of course, related to some extent to the fact that there is some kind of uh, action of Verasoro, Hamiltonian action, which, has, which includes the co-cycle or central extension uh, on that moduli space. Uh, may, maybe just to give you uh, a preview, um, I think mm, the, uh, like, mm, the most content is in this point. So why is it actually Virasoro? This is uh, somewhat unexpected, and we spent a lot of effort trying to understand whether it's actually correct. It turns out to be correct, and how, wh how and why it works. So, so mostly, let's say, we'll be, we'll be spending our time on understanding why uh, and how this is true. So maybe uh, uh, let me... Let me now try to, um, to set up things in a little bit more regular way. Um, so let's see which colors work best on the board. Um, so we are thinking about, oh, that's, that's not so bad. So we are thinking about the surface with a boundary and in a little bit perverse way, I'm gonna denote this surface by sigma bar. So this is a closed surface with boundary. To D and, and uh, as before, I assume that there is just one boundary component, but that's easy to generalize if one wants. Uh, and then um, sigma, will be the interior of that sigma bar. You will see why it's a convenient way to, uh, to, 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 to set up notation. And then, uh, right, we consider metrics, we consider Riemannian metrics on sigma. Uh, so these are so-called zero, zero metrics, or sometimes they uh, called in literature, conformally compact metrics. Um, and to explain 
uh, to explain what this means, uh, maybe I can even do it here. Uh, we're going to often use a local coordinate system near the boundary. Let's call the coordinate along the boundary x and the boundary defining function y. So, so then this means the following. Near the boundary, y squared times g is a normal metric. Normal Riemannian metric on sigma bar. So uh, this uh, uh, y squared g extends to the boundary and defines a metric at least on the color of the closed surface. So, of course, you all know very well um, the standard example of such a metric. And from time to time, we're going to use our intuition about it, right? So, we take our surface to be the upper half plane with the standard coordinates and g to be the point metric. So then here it's visible that if you multiply by the boundary defining function y square, you get the standard Euclidean metric on the upper half plane, which is the normal Riemannian metric on the closed upper half plane. So um, let's define hype sigma, so this will be zero matrix on the surface with a condition that G is hyperbolic. So that's the set of such zero matrix on sigma. So then there are two interesting spaces that we can think about. So the first space is an infinite dimensional type mirror space. So these are those hyperbolic metrics. Modular, the uh, connected component of the diffeomorphisms uh, which preserve the boundary. Right, so those, sorry, which fix, which fix the boundary point-wise. So the diffeomorphism is one, is identity on the boundary, and also I consider the connected component of the um, diffeomorphisms. So uh, there is uh, another space, so which would be a quotient by the full orientation preserving diffeomorphism group, which uh, also fixes the boundary. So this space would typically have some orbifold singularities because you divide by the mapping class group. So this space is infinite dimensional, but in some sense smooth. Um, so they carry action. So this one carries the action of, uh, since we already fixed that the boundary is a circle, so this guy carries the action of uh, diffeomorphisms of the circle, and this gadget carries, carries an action of its universal color. Right, diffeomorphisms of the circle is not simply connected because it contains the circle, so these are, so these are the natural these are the natural actions. Right, now, um, um, the result, or the results, so those two spaces, Type mirror sigma and M sigma are infinite dimensional
symplectic spaces. So the action of diff plus, perhaps I don't make it precise whether it's a universal cover or just, the, or maybe I can say universal cover because of course you can always say the universal cover acts, right? Um, action. is Hamiltonian. Now, uh, so this means there is a moment map. We'll get back, we'll return to it uh, in more detail, but I can say now the moment map is not equivalent for, for, for that group, right? It's equivalent for the central extension, and that's, uh, that's this Virasoro word. That's where it comes from. is equivalent for the standard central extension by the circle or by, by the line, depends on whether you look at diffeomorphisms or, or the universal cover. So this is... And finally, Reduce spaces, so you take the moduli space and you reduce it by div plus s1. Here, you, you probably know, right, at the reduction, you should say at which level you reduce, and uh, the levels are labeled by positive real numbers. This depends on the group with which you reduce, and in this case, so this is, uh, this is labeled by, uh, by those positive real numbers, and uh, they turn out to be uh, equal to Mirzakhani uh, moduli spaces of hyperbolic metrics, and uh, what is the Mirzakhani space? So, um, in this picture, if you have a hyperbolic metric, uh, which is a zero metric with this infinity boundary, then somewhere here, oops, maybe we need a different color. There is a closed geodesic. And this closed geodesic, it has some lengths. And So the length of this closed geodesic is equal to the level at which you reduce. So, uh, so the spaces that you get here, they are Teichmüller spaces with uh, now a geodesic boundary where the length of the geodesic is fixed by your reduction level. Sorry? No, but I mean when you, uh, when, 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 when you increase the boundary defining function, there will be a, a unique uh, closed geodesic which is homotopic to the boundary. It near, like, of course, depends on which, uh, like, uh, I mean, here probably there are some other closed geodesics, but near homotopically. All right, so this is, uh, this is basically uh, the list of results. I uh, plan to spend the um, rest of the time uh, torturing you a little bit and explaining why some of this stuff is true, if it's okay for you. All right, so, um, so we're gonna focus on the um, symplectic forms first. So why, why those spaces have symplectic forms or maybe an easy equation why they have two forms. Um, all right. So um, let's do the following. Let's locally introduce a co-frame, right? We're given some uh, Riemannian metric. Let's locally introduce a co-frame. Uh, 
alpha 1, alpha 2. An orthonormal co-frame for G. So then, uh, by Cartan's moving frame formalism, uh, there is a unique one form, let's say, again, locally on sigma, such that, and here, um, at least with Eckhart, we almost always disagree on the signs. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, I, I should at some point learn how it's done correctly, right? So that's maybe, or by the signs, Right, depend, depends on your definitions, right. So then, um, there is a following fact. So, G is hyperbolic if and only if the following two form with values in two by two matrices is an SO2 flat connection. In fact, so this is part of the relation between the JT gravity and the so-called BF theory, right? In, uh, in physics, you know, in many instances, the JT gravity would be replaced by BF, and then in terms of BF, you would do something. So BF, right, it's a gauge theory, and that would be the gauge field of that gauge theory. Okay. Now, um, why is it advantageous uh, to have this two form. So that's because um, there is the uh, so-called Atiyah bot symplectic structure uh, which uses flat on flat connections. And right, so famously, this two form is expressed as follows. So here I denote by delta the Durham differential on the space of connections. Right, so, so that's a two form, it's clearly closed and um, so there is the whole technology, right, of working with those Atiyah board two forms and extracting symplectic structures out of them. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's that, that's a very good question. It's probably the same, even though, even though, let's say, I, I would, like, actually, you know, I was planning to ask the audience that question in the end of my talk, but you, <laughs> uh, you see, it probably should be the same, but uh, here there will be a lot of detail, so that's, that's my step number one, and maybe we can rediscuss it after my step number ten, whatever, like, kind of probably, of course, that must be in some way the same, but uh, m maybe I just, just as a preview, my question was, uh, right, I would need to still do many steps to get my whatever, symplectic form. And uh, I was wondering whether actually physics could tell me right from the beginning that that's what I should have done. Because we spent some effort trying to extract a symplectic two form out of it and yeah, it was like we had many ups and downs, but maybe, probably, or usually, right, the physics would give you the correct prescription to start with. Yeah. Tom. Uh, 
Yeah, but, uh, but probably the theory, right? The theory tells you what the symplectic form should be or... Okay, let's, 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 let's talk about it later. Okay, but in any event, right? That's, uh, that's the two form. That's our starting point. Now, maybe one remark. Uh, this form is um, invariant under gauge transformations. So this means that if we split our surface into charts and we would have some, right, usually or perhaps sometimes it's not, it's not very convenient to use a global co-frame, right, even, even if it exists. Or we, we're going to impose further conditions that make usually those co-frames do not exist globally, but uh, when you go from one co-frame to another, uh, this is a gauge transformation in terms of this uh, connection. And since this two form is uh, gauge invariant, I can easily glue charts. So this means that basically I don't need to further think about gluing those charts. This two form will do it automatically for me. All right. So, um, however, uh, this uh, construction does not quite apply to our context. So um, why is that? Let me, sorry, maybe before asking a question, let me tell you a little bit more about the uh, geometry near the boundary, right? So the question would be, uh, what happens with this connection near the boundary? Uh, to do that, let me uh, say, what would be uh, an orthonormal frame near the boundary? Right, the orthonormal frame, it would be something, uh, let's say, in our, uh, w w w would be, a, uh, or maybe, maybe let me start immediately with an orthonormal co-frame. Um, sorry. So, um, so in fact, an orthonormal co-frame near the boundary, uh, it roughly looks like this. So uh, there will be, so there will be singularity, right? Because the metric would explode as one over y square plus maybe more stuff. And maybe a little bit surprisingly, but hyperbolic geometry has lots of whatever miracles or lots of surprises. If uh, the metric is hyperbolic, uh, then uh, alpha 2, at least I can make a choice that alpha 2 uh, always starts with dy over y. So here I, uh, I made the choice of so-called adapted co-frames. So uh, this means basically that one of the basis vectors at the boundary is parallel to the boundary. So that turns out to be convenient. Right. But in any event, look at, uh, at those things, right? So they all diverge as one over y at the boundary. So this means that potentially this integral, it's a little bit too brave, right? So uh, this integral over sigma, would it, would it actually, that, does it actually make sense? Okay. So now back to question one that I was about to state. Um, Yeah, me and my co-author, Mindran, can we, we, we kind of, uh, we're not on the same page. I will now give you some very, like, down-to-earth explanation that actually the integral converges, but he has a lot more conceptual, conceptual thoughts about it. So, um, so here is the fact. And this basically follows from, from this form of the co-frame and also from hyperbolicity 
of the metric. So this uh, near the boundary, this A turns out to be uh, of the following form. So, um, so this is a kind of miracle, but uh, hyperbolic geometry, I'm not at all professional in it and I'm discovering it in that project. Hyperbolic geometry is full of mirror, oh, sorry. I thought to, to, to stress it. Uh, so, 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 so it turns out that, so that this piece, which is uh, alpha one minus kappa, it turns out that it's, it's actually vanishes at the boundary. So now you see, right, when you take delta A, this guy is a constant, this guy is a constant, right? So this is O of one. So here you would have uh, one over Y, here you would have O of one, and here you would have O of Y. Which means that here in the trace, right, O of one will be paired with O of one, and one over Y will be paired with Y. So actually the integral is simply regular. So uh, the integral here in omega, it simply converges because of that. Um, so the integral is convergent, and here you can actually just write sigma bar. Um, so that's maybe the first, uh, the first surprise. The a tier board two form uh, just does make sense. Okay, um, probably, probably mind Rankin is right, and there should be some conceptual explanation. I should not be like showing you those technical details and then saying, oh, and now. You see, there is a miracle. There is like y, which multiplies one over y, and everything is regular. So there should be some kind of. Uh, Invariant, like, uh, but but you know, we are we are doing only those flat connections which come from the hyperbolic matrix, right? Because flat, those flat connections, they have some uh, singularities at the boundary. No, 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 but, but the flat connection is, uh, is, uh, should be of, uh, of the, uh, oh, okay. You know, not all the, uh, not all flat connections define uh, metrics because sometimes they would have, would define some singular metrics. So, if I write a metric which is like that, then checking that this very flat connection is flat is the same as checking as G, that G is hyperbolic. So that, that's the statement. So that would be a more tricky statement just to say which connections correspond to metrics. For that, you need this so -called, those so-called developing sections, whatever. Like th there is more geometry than involved if you want to reconstruct a metric from a connection. Now, so from that perspective, what's, the, what's this class of... Uh, Oh, like uh, locally, uh, locally, it's uh, um, how, how it's called. It's an open condition. So from from that perspective, there is uh, there is not much of a problem. But uh, and in any event, for this infinite dimensional context, one would need to negotiate what does it mean symplectic. But um, but but in any event, this, this condition is open. Right, okay, good. So um, now maybe uh, comes uh, a somewhat unpleasant part of the talk because we really need to go into, into details. We, we, we need to see kind of uh, whether this two form defines for us 
uh, a two form, let's focus on the Teichmüller space. That's a little bit easier. So I want to induce from this two form a two form on the Teichmüller space. Okay. So So let me write the following. So the Teichmüller space, right? This was a space of hyperbolic metrics divided by some component of diffeomorphisms. But, uh, but now we are not working with uh, hyperbolic metrics, we are working with adapted coframes. Right, we have this uh, whatever coframe bundle. So for the, for each metric, we're actually choosing a coframe to produce a connection, and so then uh, to go back to metrics, we need to divide by coframe rotations. But we said that the coframes are adapted, so one basis vector at the boundary is already fixed, right? It has to be along the boundary, so let me denote it by rotation zero. So these are coframe rotations which are identity at, uh, at the boundary. So this is hyperbolic sigma. And on that thing acts div zero sigma d sigma, uh, and actually, sorry? No, but I mean like, uh, right. But I, I think, let's say, in the first approximation, we don't care because the two forms glue. They exist locally, and then we're gonna glue in chats. So forget about it, in the first approximation. Right, so I need to divide by this group as well, right? To go to the Teichmüller space. So in fact, in the end, oops, sorry. In the end, I am dividing by the semi-direct product of those two gadgets. So uh, there are diffeomorphisms and there are coframe rotations. And you know, like as in uh, standard differential geometry. So this two form uh, needs to descend, right? To define something at the base, the two form needs to descend. Um, okay, so does it descend? M maybe, of course, you probably already know the answer, right? Otherwise, why would I be making such a story? The, four, the, two, the idea of what two form does not descend. Now, okay, but but there is a good news. Those two groups, they act in a Hamiltonian fashion. So they act in a Hamiltonian fashion, and maybe I should tell you, uh, maybe I should tell you what is the um, moment map. Uh, in fact, this uh, two form, the idea about two form, descends, but for a smaller group. So for some subgroup, it does descend. So let's say inside, let me denote rot zero zero. So these are coframe rotations which vanish as y square near the boundary. So those vanish as y. Though, but those vanish as y square. Uh, and here, in a similar fashion, let me say there is diff zero zero, sigma d sigma. So here, what happens, right? We already don't move the boundary, but still there is some kind of y dilation, right? You can, a diffeomorphism can dilate this, uh, uh, boundary defining function. So this guy has no y dilation. So under this subgroup, the two form descends. Why do they just multiply by y dilation? Sorry? Why do they just multiply by y dilation? By, by some arbitrary function of x. 
right? So that's so these are both infinite dimensional groups. So this one is isomorphic to maps from the circle to R, and this one isomorphic to maps from the circle to R star, R plus or R plus. Sure, but you, you, can, you can also do it in the, uh, in the coordinate independent way, of course. But, but I think that that would lead us far away. So, okay, so this, uh, so this subgroup is just fine. But unfortunately, it's not enough, right? Now, um, uh, so this means that what we are interested in So there is this group which acts in a Hamiltonian way, and the question is what, what's the moment map for it? So let me, let me write for you the moment map for it. So uh, for that, let me say that my A is something like this. Then there will be the next term, which is something like that. And here I already said I have a of x dx over y, and here I have something, and here I have something. So the moment map is given by, by those two functions, a of x and s of x. So that's, that's, that's the moment map. And uh, now let me, um, let me go for a short aside. And let me recall how reduction works uh, in general. So in infinite dimensions, suppose you have a group G acting on a symplectic manifold and uh, you have a moment map. So you're choosing some point in the dual to the Lie algebra. And um, you would like to, uh, to make sense on the reduced space. So uh, you're fixing, right? You're fixing this Xi. So then there are two, two situations. So one situation is Xi is simply a quadrant orbit, one point quadrant orbit. So it's invariant under the quadrant action, right? So then um, M Xi is mu minus one of Xi, simply divided by the whole group G. And um, so that's maybe just to, to make some allusion to the standard physics language. So these are Dirac's first class constraints then, right? So these are, so the constraints when I say that mu is equal to Xi, these are first class constraints. And so they kill all those uh, degrees of freedom which correspond to G. But now, if this is not the case, right? So then, as I wrote here, you need to divide only by part of the group. Or, you can also do the so-called shifting trick, right? So the shifting trick is to say that you take M, you multiply it by O of minus Xi, and now you divide by zero, right? Now this is, this is always first class. You first add more degrees of freedom, and then you divide by the, the action of, of the group G. So this is some kind of whatever equivalence between second class constraints and the first class constraints in the Dirac theorem. So why I am telling you all that? So that's because uh, here we're hitting exactly uh, this situation. 
So uh, I'm, I'm telling you that this is, uh, there is a moment map for this action. It's given by S and A. And notice that this A, right? This A is uh, something like uh, the part of alpha one. And so this was a co-frame. So in fact, this A, maybe I should have said it before, should have stressed it before, but this A, I can always choose it to be, for instance, positive. So A of X is a positive function. Now uh, you can ask me, uh, Right, I'm hitting some coadjoint orbits of that group, right? That's a moment map. Uh, it takes values in the dual of the Lie algebra. And what are the coadjoint orbits that I'm hitting that way, right? Because on that depends on what kind of reduction I can do. And here there is the next surprising fact. So A of X bigger than one. S of X is anything. is a quadrant is a quadrant orbit of that group so there is a unique quadrant orbit that you are always hitting when you are looking at those uh, hyperbolic metrics right so this means that well you need to do the shifting trick if you want to make sense of it so the Atiyah bot two form does not descend, but uh, if you do the shifting trick, the two form will descend. So the Teichmüller space is equal to adapted coframes times this quadrant orbit. divided by that group. No, 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 the orbit is completely infinite dimensional. In fact, this is, this is a description of the orbit. All positive functions A and all arbitrary functions S. So it's the orbit of one zero. Uh, yeah, you can say it's an orbit. Yeah, it's an orbit of any, you know, in particular, it's an orbit of one comma zero, even though here I can readdress to you the remark from the audience, this probably depends on the coordinate, on the coordinate choices, when, when you state it like that. All right, so, uh, so now the, the Teichmüller space is a symplectic quotient at zero, of, uh, of that gadget. So, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 right. But you know, towards the end of the talk, of course, I start cheating more and more and being less, uh, less and less uh, consistent. All right. So, so far, so good. So, this, uh, so the conclusion is. So there is a canonical two form. Now, um, of course, as Ezra pointed out, right? So, so you can do the shifting trick, but now as you know, when you know that it works, you can choose any A and S, right? And, and go back to the, uh, to the reduction at that particular point. So they should all be equivalent, right? You can choose one and zero, or five and uh, sine x, or whatever, whatever you want. And uh, so this this would be this would be all different representations of supposedly the same the same two form. Now uh, may, maybe now it's a good uh, point to restate that question again. Uh, I I can be, would would be really really nice if physics told us from the very beginning that roughly that's what we should do. Uh, or, or maybe, of course, it would took away our research. I, I don't know, but like, yeah, I, I, I'm still wondering how like, probably, right, the writing should be on the wall somewhere, but which wall, <laughs> which wall to look at, I, uh, I, I, I don't know. Okay, okay. 
So now maybe the last question that I uh, want to discuss today uh, is the following. Now we said that on the Teichmüller space, Uh, there is an action of uh, uh, div plus s1 tilde, right? And um, so uh, I claim that this action is also Hamiltonian. And this action correspond has a center extension. So this means uh, that is Hamiltonian not for this group, but for its uh, center extension. So here may be one very interesting fact. D plus S1 naturally acts on coframes and naturally acts on the quadrant orbit. Both actions are Hamiltonian. Here I start cheating a little bit, but and uh, the action on coframes, which means the action corresponding to the atiad board form, has absolutely no center extension. That's actually, uh, for me, was for a long time some kind of contradiction in nature, because it, it's known that when you do a tier board, you can also consider the action of diffeomorphisms on connections. And then, uh, you can ask how, what happens if the surface has a boundary. Then there will be an action of diffeomorphism of the boundary. And that action, or like in a physics language, it would be like a classical Shugavara construction. A classical Shugavara construction has no central extension. So the, uh, the level, whatever, is zero. Uh, but it turns out that the action on the quadrant orbit so that one has a center extension. So all the center extension for the action on the Teichmüller space comes from that quadrant orbit. All right, so, um, okay. Now, um, maybe just, just, uh, just to show you some scary formulas and tell you some funny story to finish. So scary formulas, what's the moment map? So the moment map for, uh, for the action of, uh, of the center extension, these are so-called heel, heel operators, or whatever, Schrodinger operators, or sturm liouville operators. So these are, these are uh, uh, second order differential operators <coughs> on the circle. So T of X is a periodic potential. So basically I should tell you what is this T of X. And so T of X uh, turns out to be the following thing. So these are, th this is this function A that we already know. So there will be some function K G of X plus one half A double prime over A minus three half A prime over a squared, so some kind of horrible expression, which uh, in, which includes this uh, this moment map function a, and uh, k of g. Uh, that's that's another miracle of um, that's another miracle of hyperbolic geometry. So k of g is the following thing. So you uh, you consider the geodesic curvature of the line y equal constant. So you take your boundary defining function, you take a line y equal constant, you take k of x y minus one over y square, and you take a limit when y goes to zero. It turns out that this, thing, this gadget exists, this limit exists, and it defines for you a function on the boundary. So this turns out to be uh, the moment map. And maybe the last thing, 
Unfortunately, that's a joke I already used, or whatever, the, the story I already used in Paris, but still, there are many people who haven't heard it yet. So, uh, you know, this is uh, in the Virasoro, in this Virasoro business, this, this is called the hill, hill, uh, hill operator. And uh, in one of my talks, someone asked me in the audience, like, why hill? Who, who was hill? What, 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 what's the story about hill? And uh, to my uh, shame, I didn't know, but someone, in the, someone else in the audience knew the answer. And uh, so, um, actually, this guy was called G.W. Hill, and uh, he was an American mathematical physicist in the end of the 19th century, and he started the motion of the moon. And that's how he came up with, uh, with that equation, and in particular, so I give, you, I give you a reference, and I hope this reference impresses you. So, uh, so, so uh, uh, <laughs> his uh, paper uh, is published, so that's actually the second paper published in Annals, during the whole history of Annals. So these are pages 5 to 10 of volume 1, number 1, of Annals in Mathematics. Sorry? Oh, the first one was also some astronomy stuff. I, I looked it up. Uh, but then, you know, it's uh, like one, one more twist to the story. You see, I actually looked at the paper, and on page 10, it doesn't end with, like, conclusions or literature. It ends by to be continued. Uh, so it, it, <laughs> it was like a little bit like a TV series or a soap opera or whatever, because in, in like uh, number two, <laughs> the, 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 the article would continue, and then in number three, the article would, con would continue. So the reader would have to wait for the next issues uh, to see the end of the story. That's how Annals of Mathematics looked in uh, 1884. Right, let me stop here. No. Probably no. I I I I uh, let's say I I didn't use anything of the uh, physics story, with the exception of the fact that they told us, oh, we we see that it is symplectic, and as I said, we started by doubting because it it's 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 presented in a very different way. But in the end, it is correct. Probably they knew from the very their argument. Probably they they hold true. We just don't know how they really work. In particular, you know, they speak about some kind of wiggly boundaries. They, even the space, even the space, for them, it, it's not, ex or we, we don't know, but even the space, it's not obvious that, that this is the space that I spoke about. Because they're saying, oh, let's assume that our, there is some ideal surface with an infinity boundary, and our surface is almost like that, but not quite. It, the, there is some, some, something which wiggles like the, our boundary wiggles, and uh, this, this is our infinite number of degrees of freedom, this wiggling, whereas uh, we define the space of, as a quotient of some space of metrics by some diffeomorphism group, and um, at least from the, from the outset, nothing wiggles anywhere. But yeah, but may, may probably it, it should, should, be, should be the same. Yes. Compact the algebra would involve some of the, the dual possible And I don't know what the story would be for S O two R, but I wonder whether you But you uh but but what you what you're talking about is a much more advanced story. That's that that's that, that's a quantum right in, in for for the universal enveloping. What what, what we are doing here is just Poisson uh, Poisson geometry, and they are like uh, there is uh, there is no central extension at all. So like yeah. But for the Virasoro, I think you said there was a central 
Yes. Yes. Uh, no, but the classic, classically, if you do Shugavara, the whatever central charge is zero. Like it's it just just zero for for the for for that core frame part where you have the tierboard form, the C is zero, and then for this orbit. C is whatever, then it depends a little bit how you set up things, let's say one, to simplify. And so then you, 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 you take a Cartesian product of the two in diagonal action, and then the central charges add up. Zero plus one is one. That's, that's how it works. Um, yeah, no comments on topological <laughs> recursion, right? That's what I promised in the beginning. No, no, but I mean, um, this, uh, right, topological recursion, that's the story which uh, relates different genera, right? You, you build, for, you start from smaller genera and you, you're trying to, to build higher genera from smaller genera. So, yeah, we didn't seriously think about it because even for fixed genus, No, but of course there are many ways to look at it, but here, concretely, right, you have those uh, uh, moduli of hyperbolic metrics and you're trying to build moduli for like basically attaching handles. You, you, you want to understand how higher genera come about from lower genera. That's in, at least in this particular instance, uh, very concretely, that's how topological recursion would look. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the vo volumes of this, what I denoted by Mirzakani B. Remember, there were some finite dimensional symplectic spaces, which are reduced spaces by the action of diffeomorphisms. So their volumes, this, this is the, uh, that's, uh, that's the thing which has Mirzakani topological recursion. Oh, yeah, 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 sure, of course, everything, everything, of course, if you change coordinates, everything gonna change, but maybe, let, let, let me give uh, a very concrete and maybe interesting answer to your question. So suppose you, uh, you change the coordinate x, right? Then, of course, a gonna change and k gonna change, right? But, um, but then we know that the left-hand side should transform, let, let me write the formula. That's a famous and beautiful formula. So suppose I apply a diffeomorphism. X goes to F of X, right? So something gonna happen to the right-hand side. But I know what's gonna happen to the left-hand side. It should be the quadrant action of Virasoro. So that's uh, the that's so-called whatever, action with a Schwartz and derivative added. Of course, here we have some hope, right? Because there is this uh, A double prime, so it, 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 it doesn't look so bad. Still, um, it's, um, it's very beautiful and interesting, and at least to me, it looks highly non-trivial that actually it works. And I think one of the motivations in the, uh, in the physics papers, that, that was also, they, uh, they observed in some way that fact. <laughs> yeah, I don't know whether exactly this, I think they usually have A equal one, but still in some way they observe this fact. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe it doesn't answer the first one, but <laughs> you know, there is this re 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 retarded Green's function. Okay. And uh, is it correct that this lower uh, 
Sorry, could you say can loud? You, can you identify which vector uh, of the No, okay, on that question I probably cannot answer. I can, it, it's, it's, it's true that the action of the diffeomorphisms, it's, uh, in, it's uh, right, the, the diffeomorphism of the boundary, that's the quotient of the diffeomorphism of everything by diffeomorphism which preserve the boundary. On that we agree. Now, the other words that you are saying, right? Um, I think in the physics papers they are addressed in some way because they're saying that they're looking at JT with some boundary, whatever, extra boundary terms, extra boundary conditions, extra boundary something. As you may have noticed, okay, I, I don't know what exactly what those words mean to start with. And the second thing, in what we are doing, like our treatment of the boundary is uh, very clean. We, we just take the, uh, fortunately it's still on the board, we just take the Atiyah uh, board integral, it turns out that it makes sense. After that, I mean, everything, uh, but basically all the other steps, they, uh, we, we have no choice, right? We, uh, okay, let's say you, you saw what we're doing. We, we, we're just trying to, uh, to go back, to, to take a quotient to go to the space of hyperbolic metrics, modular diffeomorphisms. And in the end, after, after those steps, it works. It may be equivalent, I assume, to adding whatever, to doing something specific with the boundary. Maybe that's what the physics papers are doing with the boundary. I, okay, that I don't know. It seems to me it's somehow related to this thing you call the state shift. Yeah? This is part of that work. I forget that the boundary, you know, it's zero. Zero at the boundary. I think it's probably that is. Uh, no, but there I just prescribe the class, right? You, 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 you're right, of course, I prescribe the class of metrics at the boundary that they explode as y square. Sure, this is, uh, this is certainly, I don't know, uh, may, may it pro but probably it's not. Okay, okay, maybe, well, I, I don't know, maybe we should continue this. Uh, yeah, we, we're holding people from lunch and uh, thank you.